I could say good morning, Threshers, and pretend that I'm uh, President Gehring, but I'm not going to try. All right, let's come to order. We'll, we'll try it that way. This morning, to, woo. this morning to introduce our speaker, I'm uh, enthusiastically proud to uh, introduce Dr. Brad Bourne. He's professor of English here at Bethel College. How many of you had Dr. Bourne as a faculty member? Oh, look at all of them. That's great. Wonderful. Uh, he's been here 27 years, which is remarkable. Let's give him a hand for 27 years. I'm in a good mood today. <laughs> and he'll be introducing our speaker. Thanks, Bob. I am delighted to introduce our guest speaker this morning. Um, Harley Wagler grew up just 30-some miles west of here near Hutchison, Kansas. But he spent 40 years of his adult life in Eastern Europe and Russia. He served with Eastern Mennonite Board of Missions in Yugoslavia and Bulgaria from 1970 to 1982, then attended the University of Kansas for his advanced graduate work in Russian studies. In 1993, he left Kansas for Russia to establish and direct the Russian Studies Program, a semester-long study abroad experience for North American students, with the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities in Nizhny Novgorod, Russia, until the program was discontinued in 2010. But he stayed on there. He continued to teach literature and philosophy at Lobachevsky State University, which had hosted the CCCU program until 2021. In October of 2021, he returned to Kansas his academic interests continue to be Slavic literature, especially the author Dostoevsky, and how literature and the arts relate to the Christian faith. I first met Harley just months after graduating from college when my wife and I moved to Lawrence, Kansas for graduate school. Our first Sunday in town, we attended the Lawrence Mennonite Fellowship, where Harley was serving as the interim pastor. And it was the very next week, I think, that Harley took me and Diane out for breakfast. So my memories of that weird transition from college to a next stage of life are very positive because of that first social interaction. My strongest impression of Harley from those years is of a person of deep faith, keen intellect, gentle spirit and quiet wisdom. But I also have another memory of Harley. Um, in 1988, February, Harley and I attended a KU basketball game against the Oklahoma Sooners, the same pairing that just weeks later would play for the national championship in the Final Four. That was the loudest, rowdiest, most hopped up sports crowd I have ever been in my entire life. And Harley was in his element. Harley was right there in it, a basketball fanatic, intense and passionate. Harley, I know you bring all of those qualities um, to this topic today. I am delighted you are here to share with us. Welcome. Thank you, Brad. We need to add that just a very few days ago, Kansas once again won a national championship. <laughs> this morning, I'd like to talk to you about the Ukraine crisis I have entitled it a Russian perspective. It might correctly be labeled a lament. For 27 years, I have lived in the Russian Federation, 
worked at a university there, uh, identified with a local church there, and came to love Russian culture, the Russian people, Russian history, and the Russian sense of hospitality. So I lament this morning that we must spend time talking about the Ukrainian crisis. I lament the fact that thousands, even millions of Ukrainians are suffering because of a special military operation initiated by the Russian government. I lament the fact that this attack was unprovoked. The Russians had no reason to attack Ukraine because the Ukrainians had done something nefarious to them. I lament the fact that the Russian people, in some sense, are following false gods. I lament the fact that the media in Russia is controlled so that many of the common people do not understand what is really happening in a country, a fellow Slavic people who are their cousins, husbands, and wives, and extended families. They are suffering because of what the Russian government is doing. I lament the fact that many Russians are silent. They do not know how to respond because they know what is happening is wrong. When I get emails from my Russian friends now, they talk about other things, but they don't want to talk about this military operation because they know, as do I, the evil that is taking place and the suffering that this is imposing on countless millions. Presently in Ukraine, there are seven million refugees. Four million of those are outside the country, three million within the country. And I lament the fact that the leaders of a country that I love are making a mistake. It is worse than a crime. It is a mistake. So this morning, I would like to present the Russian perspective on what is happening. I'll be speaking more about Russia than about Ukraine. But forgive me, because Russia is the country where I lived and the country that I know best. I made several visits to Ukraine, and I will talk about them in the course of my presentation. But my feeling this morning is very much like that of Mikhail Lermontov, one of the finest Russian poets of the 19th century. About 200 years ago, he wrote a poem which all Russian school children learn by heart, and it expresses some of my feelings. He says, I love my fatherland. It's called Rodina, which is motherland. I love my fatherland, but with a strange kind of love. And then he goes on to say, that I don't love my motherland because of our bloody history, all the bloodshed that we have inflicted upon other people during the course of 1,000 years of Russian history. I'm not proud of that, and that's not why I love Russia. And then he goes on to say that I love Russia for the simple people, the simple peasants. 200 years ago, Russia was a peasant country common people living off the land. And so I share Lermontov's feelings this morning. I love Russia, but it's a strange love because I feel 
that Russia is inflicting unspeakable pain on their neighbor Slavic brethren. Russia accepted Christianity in 988. That's a thousand years ago. And here I have a map of what the first Russian state looked like. It was called Kievan Rus. The foundation, the center of that uh, organization was called Kievan Rus because the center was in Kiev and the Slavic people who lived there were called Rus. Hence the term Russia. But the capital, the first capital of this principality was called Kievan Rus and most of the people who lived in that area were not Slavs. There were many, many other uh, tribal groups all the way from the Hazars who actually lived in what is today uh, Kazakhstan they accepted the Jewish faith and then you have the Pechenegs and the uh, Derevliani, the Polyani, many many other non-Slavic tribes who lived in that area. This was the foundation of what became the Russian Empire. Several years ago, I was in Kiev, and uh, I, have, I had not visited uh, Kiev for many years, and so I wanted to visit the home of one of the most famous Russian authors, Mikhail Bulgakov. Uh, who wrote most famously his novel, The Master and Margarita. As I was looking for this house where Bulgakov grew up, I went over to the Dnieper River, which is the river running through Kiev, and there is a huge monument to Vladimir I, Vladimir the one who baptized the Rus, the Slavic tribes, to become Christians in 988. So this is the monument to Vladimir. Notice he's holding a cross. And while I was there, standing beside the monument, I approached uh, two Ukrainian policemen and asked them, where can I find Bulgakov's uh, house, his childhood home? And because of the tensions between Russia and Ukraine at that time, I spoke English. And they looked at me and uh, I don't understand. So I switched to Russian because I figured Russian would be offensive to the Ukrainians. Quite on the contrary. Once I spoke Russian, they, oh yes, we know. Go down this pathway and eventually if you go along the embankment, you will find the Bulgakov house. So. Uh, I was standing beside the monument to Vladimir who created this Kievan Rus principality and Christianized it. At that time when I was in Kiev, almost everyone I spoke to spoke Russian. I was cautious because knowing the tension between Ukraine and uh, Russia, I wanted to speak Ukrainian, but I don't know Ukrainian, so I spoke English. Well, the people said, speak Russian, we can understand you. Here is a map of present-day Ukraine, and notice the red uh, shading in the eastern part of the country. That indicates these are people who speak mostly Russian. That dark red spot, that is the Donbass region. And this is crucial in today's uh, conflict between Russia and Ukraine because Russia wants to take back that Russian-speaking territory known as Donbass. Notice at the bottom of the map there is Crimea. Crimea is now, according to the Russian narrative, a part of Russia because the people there are Russian. Well, to get back to the monument there beside the uh, 
Dnieper River, I went over to find the house where this author had grown up as a child, Mikhail Bulgakov. He is most famous for his novel, The Master and Margarita. It is an incredible novel. I encourage all of you to read it. I have met only one Russian student in all the years that I have been teaching there, only one Russian student who had not read that novel. Outside of class, you get wrapped up in the amazing talent of this man. So I finally walked over and met, uh, or found the house where Bulgakov had grown up. Here is the statue of him, and I noticed that they spelled his name in Ukrainian, not Russian, even though he wrote exclusively in Russian. This is the house where Bulgakov grew up, where he spent his childhood. I had a fascinating time there. And I'd like to talk about a few crucial statements that Bulgakov made in that novel. At the very beginning of the novel, two men are sitting in Moscow in front of Patriarch's Pond on a bench. And they are discussing, well, you know, does God exist? That's one of the crucial questions because the novel is about the devil coming to Moscow and spending a week there and creating all kinds of mischief. But as they were sitting on the bench, suddenly out of the air appeared a very tall person wearing a checkered jacket and a, a cap and started visiting with them. And the two men sitting on the bench said, this cannot be. Etva ne mojet wit. This cannot be. How does a man suddenly appear out of the heavens and talk to us? But the author corrects them by saying, but alas, it was. When I look at the pictures of Bucha, when I look at the, the destruction of Mariupol, when I see how missiles hit a train station even this morning in eastern Ukraine, I say, that cannot be. But alas, it was. This is reality. Another striking statement that Bulgakov makes in this wonderful novel is Margarita. Manuscripts don't burn. Manuscripts don't burn. There are certain truths that exist throughout all eternity. You can destroy art, you can destroy religion, you can destroy uh, worldviews, but there are certain truths that cannot be destroyed. And this is, in large part, the point that Bulgakov is making in this novel that there are spiritual forces in the world that cannot be destroyed. And uh, while I was in that museum, I, uh, after the tour that they gave us, they offered us tea, which is a wonderful tradition, drinking tea. And with me was a couple from eastern Ukraine in this red area, Russian-speaking area of Ukraine. And, I, and we drank tea together, and so I asked them, what is your view on the Kievan government? Talk about politics, because Bulgakov touched on politics in this novel. And she said, you know, we have never accepted the Kievan government. That is, the Russian speakers in this red area, in the Donbass area, have never liked the uh, Kievan government, uh, which was displaced in 2014, which is a crucial date. So Bulgakov, in this novel, deals with spiritual reality 
and with political reality. Here you can see the, the duality, Bulgakov, the artist, and Stalin, the great leader, the political leader. And you see at the bottom there uh, a crucified Christ. And that brings us then to what was the foundation of Kievan Rus? It was Orthodox Christianity. The people were baptized and became, as a result, a Christian civilization. This is a painting by a man named Mikhail Nesterov. It's called Holy Rus, Holy Russia. Notice it is a child who is leading Russia. This is the best part of Russian culture. They are being led by a child in their childlike mystical faith. Notice the people who are following, according to this painting, are people like Dostoevsky and Tolstoy. Tolstoy is the one on the right. Dostoevsky is the figure on two people to the left there. Monumental writers, artists. Tolstoy thought much about the question of patriotism and faith. In fact, one of his books published in uh, in the 1890s was called Christianity and Patriotism. He said, patriotism is slavery. That's one of his famous quotes. In all history, there is no war which was not hatched by the governments. The governments alone, independent of the interests of the people, to whom war is always pernicious, even when successful. The greater the state, the more wrong and cruel its patriotism, and the greater is the sum of suffering upon which its power is founded. Dostoevsky was in many ways a dissident. He disagreed with, with the government and spoke out openly about it. As a young man, he served in the military. He went down to Crimea to fight in the Crimean War of the 1850s. He was almost shot. He went out as an officer leading the charges. He heard bullets whistling past his, his head. And he became a pacifist later in life. This is the uh, Tolstoy estate in Yasnaya Polyana. And for his actions, he spent many days in court trials because he was tried for disloyalty to the state. And this is the a picture of the courthouse there, and this is a plaque on the side of that courthouse saying that the 1890s, 1880s and 1890s, Tolstoy was charged with various crimes against the state because he was not a loyal patriot. He was also not loyal to the church, to the Orthodox Church. He was excommunicated from the church he founded his own religion called Tolstoyanism. And this is his grave. I went out to the grave and uh, spent time there. Notice there is no cross, there is no tombstone, nothing, just grass. It looks like an Amish grave. This is the end of Tolstoy. And I asked myself, did he find the happiness that he was searching? Because, by the way, why did he choose this grave site? When he was a little boy playing with his brother Nikolai, they found a twig, and in their play they said, this is the twig of happiness. This is the secret of happiness. So these two little boys buried the twig there, and this is the site. This is where Tolstoy is buried. And I've often wondered, did he find happiness? Because he rejected the, the church, he rejected Christ. That is the life of Tolstoy. This is the center of Kiev. In 2014, a crucial event happened at this site. 
This is the main square called Maidan in Kiev, where the Ukrainian people rebelled against the sitting president, Viktor Yanukovych, who was very much pro-Russian. So there was a revolution in 2014. This is crucial for further events in this, in our uh, meditations this morning. This is the central square and it has become a, an open outdoor museum. As a result of the overthrow of Viktor Yanukovych, the elected president, of uh, Ukraine, and by the way, the United States was very actively involved in the overthrow of this government. That I know, we, we know that from statements by pe uh, people such as Jeffrey Pyatt, who was the U.S. ambassador, and Victoria Nuland, who is to this day an assistant to the uh, Secretary of State. The new interim president was this man, Oleksandr Turchinov, who was an elder in the largest Baptist church in Ukraine, in Kiev. He is most famous for walking around in camouflage uniforms and a gun because he was in charge of these special forces. It's like a, a paramilitary organization. One of the first things he did after becoming interim president was to go to Donbass, to the eastern part of the country, and bring order to the people who were protesting against the Kievan government. You cannot protest against me, even though we spent four months protesting against Yanukovych. This is Alexander Turchinov, and his actions caused great consternation among the Baptist community in Russia because he was a military man. Now, just a few more things. I see I need to rush along. This is the new church that is built in, uh, in Moscow to celebrate the annexation of Crimea, as they, they call it that in Russia. It's a big Orthodox church in Moscow dedicated to the military forces. It is the church devoted to the military forces of Russia. And here is Sergei Shaigu, the Minister of Defense, the head of the military in Russia. They wanted to put mosaics in with pictures of Stalin and Putin. But uh, the, the Orthodox Church itself, I, I give them credit for this, they said we don't need pictures of Stalin and we don't need pictures of Putin on the mosaics. Anyway, this, this is an old picture of what they wanted to do. See the picture of Stalin in the upper right-hand corner? That was replaced with uh, a poster. This is the mosaic as it appears today. Alexander Dvorkin, a, an Orthodox church leader and a good friend of mine, he was one of the strongest opponents. Let's not have Stalin or Putin on the mosaics. Now to get to the current conflict, here is Vladimir Putin. Several weeks ago, several months ago, he gave a speech in which he said the best way to understand the Russian mentality is folktales. And this is the best folktale. He said, kolobok. Kolobok is the little round cookie or bun. Grandma made for her husband, grandpa, a nice little cookie, kolobok it was called. Cooled it after baking on the window and the kolobok said, I don't want to sit here and be eaten and rolled out into the forest, met a wolf and a bear and uh, a dog. They all wanted to eat it and it, each time it would say, don't eat me, I will sing you a song. And so the wolf and the bear and, and the dog, well, that's a nice song. I, I, I won't eat you after all. And then uh, along comes a fox and he said, I'm going to eat you. And the 
color book said, well, let me sing you a song. Please don't eat me. Well, the fox said, I can't hear you. Sit on my nose and sing a little bit louder. And guess what happened? Up, the fox gobbled up the color book. Putin says, that is the best way to explain the Russian mentality. People are nice to you. You can have all kinds of culture. You can have resources, oil and gas. They want that, but they will eat you. They'll consume you. Anyway, this is what is happening in Ukraine today. Here is a map of the Russian invasion, which happened in February. It is not called a war. It is called a special military operation. Notice how they moved from the north, from the east, and from the south. But it's not a war. Here is the leader of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky. And this is what is happening in Ukraine today. This is in Bucha, which is widely uh, noised today as a site of war crimes, genocide. This is right beside the church there in Bucha. Notice the graves beside it. This is a satellite image documenting that this actually happened. Here is Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, visiting the site, and he, he is deeply touched. Who are the people who are advising Putin? Why did he do this at this time? I do not know. I was shocked. My response was like Bulgakov. This cannot be. But alas, it was. One of the philosophers behind it is a man named Alexander Dugin. He's an old believer of old believer origins. He is uh, very closely associated with Putin. And some people call him Putin's philosopher or a Rasputin like the advisor to Tsar Nicholas II. He's a traditionalist and he's a Eurasianist. That means he views Russia as the center of the Eurasian political space and it needs to use force, power, military power to, to ensure that. And another important philosopher is Timofey Sergeyev. He wrote a famous uh, essay just a couple of weeks ago called What Should Russia Do With Ukraine? And he is a follower of a, a, another philosopher named Alexander Zinoviev, who was also a Eurasianist. This Eurasianist document, uh, point of view, asserts that Russia must assert itself against what are called the Atlanticists or the Western people. I'd like to close by quoting a few words from Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin, the Russian Shakespeare. This is, one stanza of this poem is inscribed on this monument in the center of Moscow. This is where the people who protest against the war meet at the, Putin, at the Pushkin monument. And this is what he says. He says three things in this one stanza. All my life I have fought for freedom, mercy for the oppressed, and engendered good feelings or love among peoples. That is what we should be doing. In Ukraine today, there are many people who have special prayer uh, activities. This is in Kharkiv, one of the cities that's being bombarded by Russia. This is the Baptist Church. They regularly meet on the main square every day to pray for peace. And this is a famous uh, iconic photo that was taken of these Baptists in Kharkiv. And this is the Orthodox priests praying for peace also. There is much more that I could say, and I lament the fact that we don't have more time, but uh, 
Let us pray for peace in Ukraine. Let us pray that God would work in the lives of the leadership to bring this horrible conflict to an end. I apologize for going over time, but uh, we, we do may have some time for questions. If, are there any questions? Or, Awesome. Thank you so much for talking to us today. Um, I was wondering if there were actions that uh, we as Bethel College students in North Newton, Kansas can take uh, to, to help in some sort of way. I was wondering your thoughts on that. Very good question. Uh, it is something that has affected all of us very deeply. I will say this, Mennonite Central Committee is actively involved. Red Cross, there are hundreds of organizations, but speaking at uh, Bethel College, I think it's important to note that MCC is actively involved. They have a Mennonite center there, and uh, the, the leader there, Alachowski and uh, Rahuba, uh, are both still active in the region there, and they are bringing in relief uh, aid packages are, are being sent to Poland and Romania and Moldova. Uh, but most of the Russian Christians, I believe, would tell you to pray and be informed. Follow what is happening and pray for peace. Like uh, Psalm 122 says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Let's pray for the peace of Ukraine. Uh, and you can go online. There are many churches that are doing independent assistance there also. I know of about a dozen different church organizations that are working there. The important thing is to be aware and uh, be active. Uh, again, thanks for speaking. Um, so you spoke a little bit about the idea of the fact that wars are usually caused and run by governments, despite of the fact that the people usually most of the time, I mean, they're not, they, they don't have the original reason to go to war most of the time. Um, and they're usually just the pawns being used by, by the government. Um, is there any way, like, what, do you have any ideas for, like, that, that you could recommend that we could potentially take more preventative measures from keeping governments from needing to, to, you know, desiring that they think they need to go to war in the first place to prevent this from even okay. happening. Well, I wrote an article last week about, primarily about what the churches are doing, what actions they are taking to try to stop, at least let their voice be heard. Because in Russia, it is now a crime to call this a war. It is a crime to do what they say, uh, promote fake news, like for example, the fact that civilian targets are being hit. You cannot say that in Russia. But I can testify, and I'd be willing to show you some of the documents afterwards if you are interested. There are many, many churches in Russia, and the Orthodox Church also. Uh, a large group of Orthodox priests have come together condemning this categorically and saying that we are against this war and we, Russians, are to blame for it. We need to confess and repent. What can we do? Uh, one of the comments I received after 
the, the little piece that I wrote was, the cry of false Christianity by the pastor in Mariupol. Mariupol is a city that has basically been destroyed completely by the Russian invasion. It's very important for them because they want a land corridor going down to Crimea. And the pastor, there are a number of Protestant churches there, and this is what the pastor said. You in Russia are begging us to pray, and on Sunday morning you go to the church and speak nice words about peace. He said, this is false Christianity. We need to take up arms. This is the temptation. Uh, and the, the comment goes further to say, this is heartbreaking in that it fails to recognize the sovereignty of God. However, as much as I hate to speculate about this, I wonder what the overall response of our Mennonite churches would be if we found ourselves in the same situation as our Ukrainian brothers and sisters, there are serious doubts in our church about the practicality and even the godliness of choosing to remain unarmed even in dire situations. And then another comment after that was, I had the very same thoughts when I read the article. How many of us would take up arms to defend the motherland? Early Anabaptists were identified and subsequently imprisoned or martyred by the authorities simply because they were not carrying swords. Uh, so it's, it's an important question. Uh, I was known at the university as uh, a Mennonite, even though I never advertised it. And uh, they knew about my positions on war and peace. And I think they respected that, even though they did not agree with me. Some of my closest friends uh, sent their children down to Donbass to help fight against the Ukrainians. It's difficult, difficult question. And that's why I lament, because many of my Russian friends do not agree with me on this and they have no voice. Those who do agree with me are silent. Thank you, Harley. We uh, appreciate your lament and uh, your exhortation to us as well. Let's uh, show our appreciation for our speaker. And you are dismissed. <laughs>